Welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, a show about weirdos, with your hosts, John Fahey and Darren Peter. Folks, welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity. My name is John Fahey. We are back here with our fifth episode on the Unpopular Opinion Network for the first time. Uh, we have a small plug here. Studio headphones from Stockholm, Sweden. That is studio as in studio without the T. Uh, if you are shopping for some Volvo of headphones, the tempur of headphones, yeah, please shop there and... Prices range from $50 up to $99. If you add in the promo code PROFILES15, you save 15%. So please get involved with that and support Profiles and Eccentricity and the Unpopular Opinion Network. Yeah, a little bit of that uh, will trickle its way down to all the old way John down. And, and, and my mouth. Yes. Uh, so if you enjoy eccentric profiles, yes. go and buy some very well-engineered headphones. Absolutely. And put in the code, save a few bucks for yourself. Yeah. And uh, go ahead and have fun. Yeah, have fun with it. Today on the program, Aaron makes his profiling debut, giving me a wee bedtime story. I uh, deliberately stayed in the dark on this one. Sounds like a fascinating character. Aaron, regale me, baby. John, are you ready to have your mind blown? I am. Are you ready to hear it straight from my mouth? I am. Okay, John, I'm very excited. I've been very excited about this one for a long time. This was a character in history that I had heard of a few times here and there, and I was intrigued by it, and this was a perfect excuse from really for me to really dive in deep on it, and mm-hmm. this is right up my alley yes. for a number of reasons. I think you'll agree with me as I get into it. The person that I am doing today is one Jack Parsons. Yes. Uh, a little bit. I, I consider him the fucked up Forrest Gump uh huh. Of history. Okay. A lot of cameos here. I like that. In his life of some very also eccentric people. Mm hmm. So maybe some also some other people that may be profiled down the road. Oh, yes. Um, but Jack Parsons was born in 1914 in Los Angeles. Mm hmm. Grew up in Pasadena. He was actually born Marvel Whiteside Parsons. That's his birth name. Marvel. Marvel. Named after his father, Marvel Parsons. Uh, But his dad was a little bit of a philanderer, a Ah. a little bit of a fucker. Mm -hmm. And so his mother did something very, very unorthodox at the time. She divorced him. Mm. She left. She up and she took Marvel Mm -hmm. and moved with her family, wealthy family, Mm -hmm. to Pasadena. And (laughs) she started calling him Jack because she just didn't want to be saying Marvel Right. All the time. Her ex's name. Her ex's name. Yes. You know, all the trauma of the, the cheating and the adultery and whatnot. So he, he's known as John or as Jack. And he grows up and he's a little bit of a ninny. He, he's perceived as effeminate, a little bit of a mama's boy, uh, a little bit of a weirdo. He's into the great uh, mythological stories of the past. He's into the the tales of King Arthur mm-hmm. and and Greek myths, mm. uh, and he's also very, very into a, a burgeoning category of literature called sci-fi, yes. science fiction. So this is a long time ago. You, this is, you know, 1920, mm-hmm. 1921, 1922. You know, he's, this is before antibiotics. Right. Air flight has just been made mainstream with, with World War I. Mm-hmm. And so by the time he's 14, he's really into chemistry, Science, again, obviously science fiction, the idea of, of rockets going yeah. into outer space, the kind of the Buck Rogers, Jules Verne stuff, really. Right. And so in school, he gets picked on a little bit. Um, he's bullied by, by some of the kids in Pasadena because, again, he's rich. He doesn't have a dad. He's kind of a mama's boy. And, again, he's a little uh, effeminate. And so he, he gets rescued by this working class kid, Ed Foreman. Mm-hmm. And... They strike up a fast friendship over their common passion of science fiction and kind of tooling around with with rocketry. So they're both 14 and they just start fucking around with like gunpowder and little model rockets in Jack's backyard Mm -hmm. and also in the nearby Arroyo Seco in Pasadena. So they're leaving 
pock marks all over the backyard from little mini explosions made from cherry bombs and firecrackers and stuff. And when he's 14, Jack tries to summon the devil in his bedroom. (laughs) (laughs) And he thinks he's successful. And he gets so freaked out that he kind of stops messing with the occult for a while. But don't worry, he gets back into it. (laughs) Of course. He's not a great student. He may have had undiagnosed dyslexia, Mm -hmm. or he may have just been a weirdo kid. But he gets, you know, he has trouble in school. He actually, he gets expelled from a military academy in San Diego for blowing up the toilets. Wow. Literally blowing shit up. And he then gets transferred to like this, one of these hippie schools, like Waldorf schools, where there's no wrong answer, you know? Right. And he does really well there. He really gets more into chemistry and science and physics as a young as a young teenager, and he even becomes the editor of the school newspaper, mm-hmm. and he starts getting the attention of some professors at Caltech in Pasadena. Mm-hmm. Then, so 1929 hits, and that's the Great Depression. Right. And so his family's fortune begins to dwindle, so he has to take a job, and he takes a job at the Hercules Powder Company, and he starts bringing work home with him. He starts stealing stuff mm-hmm. from work various explosives and gunpowders and whatnot. And uh, he and Ed, they're still just messing around in the backyard, making bootleg rockets and stuff. And they really get good at it. They even, he even pioneers uh, a new type of solid fuel explosive. He mixes glue with the gunpowder as a binding agent, making little molds out of tin foil, yeah. aluminum foil to kind of make a mold and reproduce these rockets kind of on, on a, for what was then uh, a mass scale for them. He even has regular correspondence with Wer- Werner von Braun. Really? As a teenager. And Werner von Braun went on to make the V2 racket, rocket for Germany. Yeah. This is all pre-World War II. But yeah. he's having regular correspondence with this guy as a teenager. He enrolls in a few schools. He enrolls in uh, Pasadena Community College. He takes a job up in San Francisco because of the financial hardships and whatnot and enrolls in Stanford. But again, he has to drop out because of the money issues and his real inability to like show up for class and and, and pay attention. Mm. Um, side note is that he was also plagued by headaches, which was probably the result of huffing nitroglycerin that he was making all the time. Wow. Just being around it, you yeah. know, uh, really kind of messes with you. So he moves back to Pasadena, and he uh, befriends him and Ed befriend. Uh, a few Caltech students, Mm -hmm. one of them being Frank Molina. And then they just start smoking pot, drinking booze, talking shit about sci-fi, and writing a a sci-fi screenplay based on their lives with some strong anti-capitalist and pacifist themes Mm -hmm. with the end goal of space travel. I mean, they're really into this idea. And this is, you know, very taboo back in the day. Like, they barely had airplanes, so yeah. you know, going to the moon or, or any sort of space travel was just pie in the sky type of stuff. In 1934, so he's 20 at this point, he meets woman Helen Northrup, and they they get married. They fall in love, get married, but times get so tough financially again that he has to pawn her wedding ring. But meanwhile, this whole time, he's still doing his pet projects with Foreman and some of these kids from Caltech, making rockets and just ex- just fucking around. Yeah. They have their first successful liquid fuel motor rocket test at the Devil's Gate Dam <laughs> in Pasadena, and they basically get brought into this research group at Caltech, unofficial, officially unofficial rocket research group at Caltech. And they gain notoriety of just like blowing shit up all the time. And everyone on campus refers to them as the suicide squad. Really? Yeah. They're reckless. They're out in the creek in Pasadena, just setting off rockets, hiding behind like little sandbags and stuff, smoking right. weed. They're maniacs. Yeah. He, at the age of, I guess he would be, so the 1937, so at this point he's 23, he's brought in as an expert witness in the murder trial of this guy, Earl Kinnett, who was the former head of LAPD intelligence, who eventually, due to Parsons' testimony, was convicted of car bombing this private investigator who he himself was a uh, former LAPD detective. So okay, wait, wait, wait. I, I gotta, I gotta understand all of the moving parts here. What's going on? By the time Jack is twenty-three, mm-hmm. he's already an expert in rocketry. Yeah, 
ne- didn't graduate college, barely graduated from a real high school. Uh huh. But he is so well known, kind of through his connections at Caltech, that he's brought in as an expert explosive. Okay, so the, this crime doesn't have anything to do with him. No, no. Good. Okay. No, no, no. He's brought in as a witness. Got it. And so he basically reverse engineers the car bomb that this former head of LAPD intelligence used to blow up another former cop. Why? Why was this cop killing this other cop? Oh, I don't know. I think there was some love triangle involved. This Ah. was the 30s, man. People were all sorts of messed up back then. (laughs) Uh, He uh, is then invited to join the Los Angeles Science Fiction League. Okay. He doesn't join it, but he does attend some meetings and he gives some some talks talking about, you know, basically predicting that one day we'll land on the moon with a rocket. Uh, And there he actually meets and, and befriends a young Ray Bradbury. Science, no shit. science fiction author. He's a teenager at that time. And he, you know, he then goes on to write, you know, sure. Sing the Body Electric and all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then in 1939, he goes to his first Gnostic Mass. So to give you some little bit of backstory, in, especially in Los Angeles in the 20s and 30s, was like the heyday of the spiritualism movement. Mm-hmm. And this, all these like occult groups were popping up around the country, a lot of them in LA. So he goes to the first Gnostic Mass at the Church of Thelema. And the Church of Thelema uh, was basically founded and, and led by one Aleister Crowley. No shit. Yeah. So Aleister Crowley, self-proclaimed antichrist, wickedest man in the world, occultist, black magician, yeah. philosopher, author, downright nasty creep. <laughs> yeah, scary. Yeah, creepy dude. Yeah. Um, and he becomes enthralled with the idea of magic and Thelemic magic, and it's... T- he basically reconciled in his head magic and quantum physics. Mm-hmm. And he saw the two as deeply intertwined. Mm-hmm. And so this was like right up his alley, right? So he tries to bring in everybody he knows into this church because he's so into it. All these sci-fi writers, his his wife, his friends, Ed. And really he gets a couple of sci-fi writers into it, but mainly he brings in his wife's younger sister, Sarah. She's into it. Oh yikes! She goes by Betty, but her name's Sarah Northrup. He that's and Hel- not going anywhere. Oh, good. oh no, that's not going anywhere. <laughs> good. Nothing good can come of this. She's like fifteen. Oh god. Yeah, you know, but also he's only he's twenty two or twenty five at this point, but right. she is a minor. He and Helen, his wife, are initiated into the church in uh, 1939, 1940, and he quickly rises through the ranks of. It's called the OTO, the Ordo Templo Orientis. Mm-hmm. It's another name for this for this church, with Crowley himself eventually proclaiming that he is the most valued member of the order without exception. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This dude is and we'll put pictures up on the website, but you gotta see this guy. He's yeah. really good looking. He looks like Tony Stark. He mm-hmm. looks like Robert Downey Jr. as I like and he is that guy, you know, this brilliant playboy. Yeah. Um so he's part of this group at Caltech. It's called GALSIT. It's just some weird acronym. But the National Academy of Sciences, in kind of affiliation with the Army Corps of Engineers, they give him a grant to develop what's called JATO, Jet Assisted Takeoff. Mm-hmm. And they named it Jet Assisted Takeoff because of the still existing stigma of rocketry. So they call it Jet Assisted Takeoff. Basically, they strap rockets onto these planes, on the wings of these planes, to speed up how fast they can take off. Right. Carriers or short impromptu runways, and, and rocketry war. is just bad mouth because it is. Is it found to be a cultish? No, no, rocketry is bad mouth because it's like saying teleportation. Gotcha. It's just that ridiculous, ridiculous science fiction. Got it. Pie in the sky stuff. So they get this grant. But a quarter of the budget just goes to fixing repairs of the buildings they fuck up, blowing everything up. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why they're called the Suicide Squad. Like, people are losing fingers and shit all the time. Yeah. Uh, in 1940, August of 1940, they got the cover of Popular Mechanics magazine. Really? Yeah, this great artwork, you know, very art deco artwork of a rocket. And late 20s at this point? No, kind? 40, 1940. Okay, I'm saying, are they in their late 20s? Yeah, so 1940, he is 26. Gotcha. Is he? Or, yeah, he's 26 in Mm -hmm. 1940. And in in their article, he's talking about rocketry and its potential uses in, you know, orbiting satellites and research and travel and eventually the moon. And and, And again, still plagued by this stigma of being just, you know, it'll never happen. The FBI... 
begins to investigate him and some of his colleagues at Caltech for mm. possible ties into Marxism. Because mm. there's a there's a Chinese guy who's a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> and so it just doesn't sit well with the FBI. <laughs> right, there's a Chinese guy. Yeah. You sure. Know. Well, I mean, honestly, can I just say real, real quick one thing? I mean... How how gorgeous is California? Having a hippy dippy school in in the nineteen nineteens or whatever. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's it's so funny. It's great. It's so funny. It's great. I mean, <sighs> and like what I mean, yeah. What a time! Like the spiritualism. Like you're saying, like what a place and time to come out. And of. and after after the war to end all wars. Right. Right. You know. Yeah. And we thought we were gonna have this new golden age, and it and and as we as you see, you know, we're about to have another war. Right. So the FBI investigates them. Um, uh, and they 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 basically say, you know what? He seems all right, um, despite his kind of weird pacifist. Despite anti- the Chinese guy. Despite the Chinaman, <laughs> yeah. But what does happen is that one of his guys in the church, one of his buddies at the church, goes to San Quentin for using Jack's gun in a drunken car hijacking. Wow. Yeah. So he he like hijacks a car, shoots some guy, and goes to San Quentin. And just it's kind of a little mar on his record, right? Mm-hmm. It brings un- unwanted attention to him. And so he continues all these uh, all this research with Gallsit continues getting funding smaller and or rather larger and larger grants uh from the government and one day he's watching um some roofers like they're pouring asphalt on a roof mm-hmm. and he's 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 been plagued with these problems with the rockets not being stable at certain temperatures or in certain environments and so remembering his experiments as a kid with glue and he also recalls this story of Greek fire from ancient myth, of which was basically an incendiary weapon used, uh, supposedly used in ancient warfare. Mm-hmm. And so he puts this all together and he uses asphalt as a binding agent for this rocket fuel. And it makes this very stable, transportable, and relatively safe, solid rocket fuel. And mm-hmm. this like revolution, this is the revolutionary idea that he had for rocketry. Mm-hmm. And that technology went on to be used. Space shuttle, the solid rocket boosters for the space shuttle, that's his shit. Yeah. The Polaris, Poseidon, and Minuteman ICBMs, Mm -hmm. his shit. Really? Yeah. It's, I mean, the stuff that he was doing is in rockets and weapons now. Wow. This was where he changed the future of warfare and travel as a 26, 27 year old drug addict. (laughs) Was he really a drug addict? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, was he just doing a lot of shrooms or like what was he, he doing? Uh, he did eventually really get into, and I'll, I'll get into it a little bit later, but weed, me, uh, peyote, mescaline, opiates, cocaine, amphetamines. Oh, God. He, okay. He's okay. into it all. Yeah, yeah. And and that's also part of the church. The church is very this permissive, hedonistic, ah. free love thing. So in 1941, just, just before the U.S. enters World War II, he starts making money in this company he founded with his guys called uh, Aerojet mm-hmm. for these jet-assisted takeoff add-ons to planes and because the U.S. is gearing up for war. So he's making money in, off the military-industrial yeah. complex. So life ca- is getting better for him. But his wife, Helen, kind of takes a break. She's like, you know, I need, a, I need to take a break from this. So she bounces, and she's like, but, you know, we're part of this church, so you can, like, fuck whoever you want. Really? Yeah. It is encouraged sure. by the church to, to celebrate this free love thing. And so naturally, he goes for the Sarah. The sister. The younger course. sister, Sarah. Right. And they go so far as by the time she comes back, the wife, he's like, yeah, you know, Sarah's my wife now. Uh, and you know what? She's hotter and we have much more sexual chemistry. And He says this to her. Oh, yeah. And she's like, yeah, you know what? Great. And she starts dating. She gets with his other friend, Smith. Oh God! I thought you were gonna say Crowley. No, no, no. <laughs> Crowley's usually in Slithering England. Around, yeah, around, yes, yeah, yeah. shape shifting, etc. <laughs> so Parsons and his wife's younger sister shack up, but also Helen and some other dude Smith. They shack up, and they all shack up in Together. this. Yes, a- along with a bunch of other people. Sure. In this giant house in Pasadena that Jack uh, leases out, called that he names the Parsonage. Oh, for Christ. Yeah, yeah. They're all living there having this free love fuck fest yeah. in Pasadena, yeah. which is very nice. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and all four of them are super tight. It's one big, you know, uh, butt fucking Brady Bunch. <laughs> and uh, it becomes the new base of the church. It moves off of like Winona Boulevard and Hollywood to the Parsonage. 
and they have he he converts the laundry room <laughs> into like his own personal lab chemicals and rockets and whatnot his bedroom he decorates with like egyptian tablets and swords and knives and a statue to, of pan really you know, the, the cloven hoof yeah deity of mischief and whatnot can i just ask you something why of why was it all the devil and the cloven hoofed do i mean from a young age dude i don't you know he did have this weird relationship with his mom and didn't uh, he didn't have a strong uh father figure at all was there a lot of religion in the house i don't know i don't think so at all but there was this draw too. I mean, maybe if you just like fire you, you think. Yeah, I mean, how bad is you're the huffing devil? nitroglycerin and sure. smoking weed with Chinamen in the in the River Creek. You know, <laughs> anything can happen. And this is again, this is that hate, the height of try uh, everything. Yeah, try everything in this that weird spiritualist occult movement that made just bubbled up. Yeah, they also had a there was like a twenty five <laughs> acre garden mini farm on the property that they would use they had livestock for food but also blood sacrifices oh god (laughs) but also in that garden he would use to lead little fairy hunt expeditions with some of the kids interesting he was you know a very very weird dude uh yeah he would greet guests that would come to these parties like with a giant snake around he had a pet snake that he would just you know walk around like britney spears in that video (laughs) like yeah welcome to the parsonage and at the mailbox, he had a mannequin dressed in a tuxedo and had the title The Resident. Um, the guy was, was fucking nuts. So the garage becomes a chemical lab and the garden, you know, for fairy hunting, uh, <laughs> as it does. But then the FBI and the Pasadena police begin to investigate. Again, so he's, again, he's back on the radar. Right. Right. And Now, what year are we talking here? We're talking, I think, like 1941, 1942. So... So he's still working for the military industrial complex, but they're still investigating him. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Of course as and to put this in context, they're investigating anyone at this point. Right. And especially Everybody's whoever's right under Yeah. Well it's right. the heyday of Hoover and yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and World War Two is going on right yeah. now, right? So they get, they're getting all this heat because the rumors are going around, you know, that they're having these wild, extravagant, orgiastic parties. Right. In the quiet little suburb of Pasadena. This is a nice little neighborhood they got going here, and they don't want some crazy drug addict rocket scientists doing crazy shit in the backyard. And so mm. a 16-year-old boy claimed he was raped at one of these ceremonies, mm. uh, and, and I witnessed accounts of naked pregnant women jumping through fires in the backyard. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but the cops would come, and Jack would play up the very professional side of his personality. I'm Jack Parsons. I'm a scientist. You know I work for the military. Yeah, the charisma must have been astonishing. Off the charts. Yeah. Off the charts. I work for the military. I'm fighting. I'm helping the war effort against fascism, and everything is on the up and up here. Right. Meanwhile, they're all, you know, they're snorting coke and doing God knows what. And this is where he really starts getting into the cocaine, amphetamines, peyote, mescaline, and opiates. Um and and again and also this the whole you know hedonistic free love stuff he's fucking everyone he he's I wouldn't he's not a cult leader but he behaves like one he's having sex with everyone he had sex with he gets his friend's wife pregnant and pays for her abortion which also back then very no no right uh, and that that strains his relationship with this guy I don't, it wasn't Smith it was another guy who doesn't matter but he did get it <laughs> clearly not to him right now it's 1943 and Germany gets the V two rocket by all the work of Werner von Braun, who th- who talked, who was conversing with Jack regularly twenty years throughout. Ago. No, not they. There was kind of a moratorium on their conversations as sure. as you know Germany kind of ramped up their war machine, you know, nineteen thirty eight. But and, did, and onward. did Parsons straight up tell him asphalt is the key? No. Okay. As far as we know, sure. No, and I don't know. I don't know if the V twos were using solid rocket fuel or not. I'm I'm sure they were, but also Germany had you know they had a crack team of of whiz kids over there figuring stuff out. Yeah. So the U S. the government shits a brick. We gotta we gotta ramp up our rocket production. We gotta figure this out, right? Mm-hmm. We gotta have something to compete with these lousy Hun bastards shooting rockets over sure. you know over over Europe. So they just start throwing way more money at Parsons and his group, um, and they rename the group. JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Yes. And the kind of open secret is that it's Jack Parsons lab. It's labs. Jack Parsons lab. Yeah. Um, because it's not jets. It is it is rockets. Yeah. Um so Parsons and Foreman eventually not too long thereafter, they sell their stake in Aerojet, which was the corporation they made as their business entity. Yeah. They sold their stake in it. Um 
because they what they said was, you know, we don't really see a future in rocketry after the war is over Mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, We really see money in opening a chain of laundromats. Yeah. So. Right. Big thinkers. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Uh, But what people really think is that he just wasn't going to work well in that corporate Atm- buttoned up atmosphere. I, th- I see this guy also being able to uh, to vibe people away. Yeah, he gives people the creeps. You sometimes. know what I mean? Because yeah. there's charisma and then there's a reverse charisma. Yeah. Where it's like, hmm. hmm, I don't know if I like, maybe the laundry is for me. Yes, people, as much as he wasn't going to work in that environment, because you know, he was a guy, I like to blow up shit in the riverbed and do drugs. I'm yeah. not going to follow your rules and take all these notes. Sure. You know, and show up at nine in the morning or whatever. So they sell their steak. They never opened these fucking laundromats, by the way. He took that money and uh, he bought the property he was at. And uh, (laughs) he continues being reckless with rockets. Him and Foreman, Ed Foreman, his childhood friend, they start a couple of companies, one called Ad Astra, meaning to the stars, Mm -hmm. and Vulcan Powder Corporation. Vulcan is a um, Greek mythical figure where the word volcano comes from. Yes. Um, again, the subject of an FBI investigation because Jack may have, during his time with the government, stolen something called X-Metal during the Manhattan Project. Really? X-Metal uh, is theorized to be enriched uranium. No so he may shit. have been fucking around with some stolen nuclear, nuclear material, like Doc Brown shit. Yeah. You know? Um, <laughs> so he he he's got some time off because he's not working for the government anymore and Mm -hmm. he's got this money and he's got a drug habit and a sexual addiction to maintain sure uh and this home with all these rooms and whatnot so he places ads in the newspaper to fill these rooms up and he the ads read something like this only bohemians artists musicians atheists anarchists or any other exotic types need apply wow any other lame people will be unceremoniously denied yeah exactly (laughs) And so he's partying and all that. But guess who shows up at his door to rent a room? Just by chance. Just by seeing an ad in the paper. Who? L. Ron fucking Hubbard. Jesus Christ. L. Ron Hubbard, U.S. Navy officer and sci-fi author, shows up. Hey, I heard you got a room for rent. Wow. I'm a weirdo. Hey, I'm also strangely charismatic and can vibe people out. Yeah. So Jack and Hubbard, they quickly become friends. They're both these weird, like, po- self-taught polymaths who are creeps, right? And so yeah. they become friends. Um, and Parsons actually writes to Crowley. And he says that with no formal training in magic, uh, he's got extraordinary expertise and understanding of the magical arts. Magic with a K, yes. by the way. Uh, and he may be in direct contact with some higher intelligence, or he might be my guardian angel. Wow. So he he's... Super in to Elrond, right? And Elrond seemingly super into him. They become really tight friends. Uh, Sarah, the younger daughter of his, still technically his wife, right. becomes in, enamored with Hubbard. Really? Yeah. And so uh, Jack, against all of his, uh, you know, higher self, he he's, he still manages to get jealous, even though he's philandering just like his dad under the, you know, yeah, uh, encouragement yeah. of his church, he still gets jealous uh, about about Sarah shacking up with um, with Hubbard. So he is motivated to find a new lover through occult means. He's like, I'm going to, all right, I, you know what? I'm going to find my own, my own side. Pe- my By own, summoning them? Yes, exactly. So <laughs> he begins a series of rituals, which he dubs as Babylon working. And uh, Bab- Babylon is this... Uh, um, theorized deity in the Ordo Templa Orientis, the Thelemic Church. Uh, you know, the red, the scarlet woman, the the woman who rides the beast and brings about the apocalypse type of shit. Yeah. So he begins a series of rituals which basically consists of jerking off on magical tablets <laughs> 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 while playing <laughs> Sergei Prokofiev's second violin concerto. 
<laughs> uh, to bring about Babylon uh, incarnate on Earth. But he also allowed Hubbard to kind of be the scribe during these sessions. So, <laughs> so Parsons is in these dark rooms listening to violin, classical music, jerking off on the tablets. And Pars- or and, and, and Elrond's in the room? Elrond's in the Hubbard taking notes and surveying the astral plane for messages. Jesus. <laughs> So this is 1945. Did they get a gal? That's 1945. <laughs> He's doing. He does this for a while. Oh yeah, it takes time. Yeah. Well, this is magic, dude. Not science. You know? I know. I know. 1946. He does his final ritual in the Mojave Desert, and he unser- He comes back and unceremoniously says, "It's done." It's done. Really? It's done. He returns home from the desert, mm-hmm. and he finds a young redheaded woman has shown up to visit the parsonage. Really. Marjorie Cameron shows up with her red hair and seemingly very voluptuous figures, the 40s, you know. And he's, <laughs> he's, a, he's immediately enamored with her, right? Uh-huh. This is the Scarlet Woman. How could it not be? Sure. Right? He did. He jerked off on the tablets. Yeah, yeah. He was chanting. You know, he also, by the way, was chanting hymns to Pan during all his rocket tests and stuff. This guy was nuts, dude. It's great. Uh, <laughs> he's performing sex magic rituals with her, with... Elrond, they eat these things called light cakes where basically are just like uh, fucked up perverted communion wafers made of semen and period blood. Jesus. You're telling me. You're telling me, dude. Oh, my God. Uh, And that's a light cake. It's a, a light cake. Ah, okay. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, so he's, you know, he's doing this for a while because he's got the time and the money to do it. And... um. He eventually, because he's so, he feels that he's completed this, he sells the house. And so he's, he's flush with some cash again, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, and Elrond's like, hey, I got an idea for a business. I got an idea to make us some money. Mm. How about you give me all your money? Mm. Uh, me and Sarah will go to Miami mm. and we'll buy some yachts. We'll buy three boats Mm -hmm. and guess what we'll sail them through the panama canal Mm -hmm. and we'll sell them for a profit here in los angeles how could it not work right elrond and sarah abscond with the money with the money yeah to miami and ghost him (laughs) and this is his life savings it's like 30 grand which is a lot of money back then right right a lot of money now yeah and he's pissed well yeah that's not gonna do at all no He's pissed. He show he he gets his way out to Miami. Shows up like on the dock. It, I guess it's easy to track people down then. And you know, some guy says, "Oh, they just left." And so he's like, "Shit, I better do something about this." Well, what is he good at? He's good at making rockets and doing magic. So he rents a motel room and starts jerking off on fucking tablets again, doing these magic rituals with the aim of uh, invoking the wrath of a vengeful Mars-based deity. Interesting. Very. But then guess what happens, John? Tell me. A squall in the sea forces Elrond and Sarah to come back ashore. No. Yes. Oh and guess God. who's there waiting for them? Old, Good old Jack. Old JP. Hey, how's that going? Yeah. And they're, he's not getting that money back. This is Elrond Hubbard we're talking about. This yeah, guy, yeah, yeah. You know. He's got your money. So uh, this vengeful spirit of Mars helps him at least reunite them in some way. Uh, and Jack threatens to take them to court to get this money back. But Sarah is so, you know, brainwashed and, and, and um, you know, dick drunk on Elrond that she's like, uh-uh, not so fast, Jack. Uh, you do that, and I will prosecute you for statutory rape. Wow. Because I'm still 17. She's still yeah, 17? I think she's like 17 or 18. Good point, God. Yeah. Uh, so he settles for $3,000. <laughs> de- the parsonage is sold and demolished. Um... In 1946, he moves to Inglewood, which is a, ni- a nice area at the time. Hell yeah. Uh, with Marjorie, mm-hmm. the uh, the Scarlet Woman that he summoned from the- The jerking off. The jerking off and whatnot. Uh, and he works on the Navajo Missile Program, which is another like supersonic ICBM type of thing. Yeah. It was, but at this point, it was meant to reach Russia. That It was designed- Really? Oh, yeah, it was to meet her, yeah. Um, and then she starts having seizures, these- uh, uh, like the kind where like you stiffen up and it looks like you're being possessed. Yeah. And he just recommends to her like, have you thought about astral travel while you're doing this to maybe kind of figure out what's going on? And Jesus. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's a mess. His life's a mess at this point. Yeah. Uh, the Red Scare happens. Uh huh. So you know the whole McCarthyism era is happening. Everyone's a communist and right. Again, Everybody that's a weirdo. Especially these guys who have anti-government sentiments or or rather um, 
anti-capitalist perhaps sentiments Mm -hmm. and unorthodox lifestyles. The Mm -hmm. FBI described him as probably bisexual, Mm -hmm. uh, certainly a communist. Um, FBI investigation, all of his security clearances that he had are scrapped uh, because of his subversive character and sexual perversions. Um, At the urging of one of his professors from Caltech, he's like, he, he enrolls in some night math classes at USC, mm-hmm. but he just he like he just he's not into that. He's not into traditional education, and so yeah. he he fails out of that too. Um, and his life really takes a, a a nosedive here even more. And he has to like start bootlegging nitroglycerin to make ends meet. No, uh, he works as a car mechanic. No shit. Manual labor at a gas station. Uh, a hospital orderly. Good God. But also a f- like a kind of pseudo faculty member at USC School of Pharmacology. Hmm. Uh, I wonder what he had access to. Right. Then, right. So he's he's bootlegging nitroglycerin, wrenching on cars, and snorting coke. Right. You know, on USC's dime. Chopping it up. Dude, you got to chop it up. <laughs> Marjorie, she's like, I need to take a break. Yeah. You're too much for me. And she moves to an artist commune in Mexico. Wow. Uh, so at this point, with no friends, no money, mm-hmm. no lovers, mm-hmm. no freaky fuck den in Pasadena, he resorts, he goes whole hog into the occult, like just nosedive into the occult and starts performing sex, sex magic with prostitutes. Good God. Um, and I guess it worked because he got a job working for Hughes Aircraft. Really? Yeah, Howard Hughes. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know the industrialist aviator, sure, and and, and himself and, a, a huge uh, you know war profiteer, yes. uh, you know contractor mm-hmm. and, and movie maker. Yes, yes, but and, and I'm I'm so surprised that Parsons wasn't balling out of control more just from his military contracts from the war. Well, a lot of partying, dude. A lot of partying. Yeah, you're probably throwing money at a lot of weird things. If you're paying him. for abortions left and right, sure. it's not easy to get. Yeah. I imagine not easy to get that amount of drugs at that time. And at this time, is this the first time him and Hughes have come into contact with each other? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so he gets a job at Hughes Aircraft. Um, later fired for uh, making like illegal copies of technical documents ah. that he may or may not have been funneling to Israel, the newly formed really? state of Israel. Uh, so he gets kicked out of there by basically, I, I want to say Howard Hughes himself. Wow. Uh, 1952, he is permanently banned from working in any way in rock with in rocketry. Uh-huh. Um, so he moves to North Hollywood. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> and starts working. Uh, he starts a company called Parsons Chemical. And he basically makes squibs and um, pyrotechnic effects for the movie industry. Mm. He reconciles with Marjorie, who moves back to Pasadena uh, with him. And uh, they rent out like a little coach house um, in the Dirty Dina. And he makes a turns again the laundry room into a laboratory to make chemicals and, and bootleg absinthe because you got a party, dude. Yeah, you do. It's a hard <laughs> life. And so they're throwing parties again. He's yeah. partying again. And his old buddies are coming back Foreman, the Chinaman, <laughs> uh, Frank Molina, the student from Caltech. And they're all partying, smoking weed, maybe talking about writing another movie again. I don't know. It's still 1952. And um, he and Marjorie are like, let's. Let's maybe go all in on this Israel thing. But first, let's move to Mexico. Mm-hmm. We'll make a mint making explosives for the Mexican government. Mm-hmm. And then they'll get us a visa into, into Israel. Uh, but a day before his planned move, he gets a rush order from some film company to make these explosives and shit. Mm-hmm. And so he, um, he heads into his makeshift lab mm-hmm. and... An explosion goes off, mm-hmm. blows off his right arm. Both of his legs are broken. His other arm is broken, and there's a hole in the right side of his face. Jesus. Paramedics come. They take him to Huntington Memorial. He dies 37 minutes later. Oh, my God. At the age of 37. Oh, my God. Word gets to his mother, Ruth, uh-huh. Uh huh. who immediately, immediately overdoses on barbiturates. She can't handle it. Oh, wow. my poor Marvel, Jack Whiteside, Parsons. Yeah. Done. Offs herself right away. The official explanation is that he was fucking around with something called fulvinate of mercury in a coffee can, shaking it with his sweaty hands, maybe on account of all the drugs. Uh-huh. Uh, it fell on the floor and blew up. Uh, some people think that it may have uh, been murder. 
I suspected murder, yeah. as you said it. It could be uh, one of his... Um, it just ex- sounds a little late in the game and at a very delicate time for a guy like that to go away. Yeah. And the day before... The he, day I mean, before, it, it's, exactly. I, some people think that Howard Hughes may have had something to do with it, with his connections with the film industry. Mm. It'd be really easy to you know for, make a shell movie company, sure. put in this giant order, and sabotage him with a, you know some sort of explosive underneath the floorboards, which is what some people think. Yeah. Um, some people think that it may have been suicide because he was prone... His father died in a mental institution. Mm-hmm. Mania, depression, etc. And he may have inherited that along with uh, his other character flaws uh and he's also a drug addict drug user like um, sure but why the day before you know what i mean again right. the circumstances right. lead me lead my mind to be more like well that's sort of convenient yeah, yeah. and are how how worried are you about these secrets escaping to israel or mexico or anywhere else right right so, so. He, he's all blown up to pieces yeah uh, uh, some of the people in his church think he died in a, a cult ritual trying to make a homo- homunculus. Yeah, which they think like, he was jerking off again. Yeah, <laughs> jerking off into tin cans with mercury and God knows what. Uh, and then there's, and then it gets weirder. Oh. And this is, I don't know how confirmed this is, but people say that when they, you know, went through all of his stuff mm-hmm. after he died, there was a little black box with all these like occult markings on it. Mm-hmm. And in the black box was a film reel. And on that film reel was footage of Jack and his mom having sex along with the family dog. Shut up. Oh, my Is God. Is it that hard to believe? Oh, my God. For real? Yeah. What do you mean? Is it confirmed? I mean, this is the 50s, man. How do you confirm anything? I mean, like, did any, did, did any, did it's any, not, I don't think the footage, I, I don't think you can go on like, well, motherless.com and find it I right know, now. I know. But I mean, is there, is there, was there any authority? That I don't said, think there was any established authority that, that confirmed this, but there are multiple accounts of this and it may have been a smear. Multiple. Account. Yeah. It may have been smear. It, right. But also like the way his mother off herself right away uh-huh. and the history that they had. And his his own weird sexual proclivities and and whatnot, uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me in the least. Uh, and it's a great way to cap uh, that profile. But th- <laughs> the thing, <laughs> the thing to to I remember, think he fucked his mom and the dog. Yeah, at the end of the day. <laughs> So, you know, the Parsons legacy lives on. JPL is still, I mean, it is the premier yeah. lab in the country for robotics. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, the Mar- the Mars rover mm-hmm. is built there. Yeah. This guy's jerking on tablets to summon Martian deities. Yeah. His rockets got stuff to Mars. There's a crater on the dark side of the moon named after him. Jesus. JPL, Jack Parsons Lab. Um so let me ask you this. He's the man, Jack this Parsons. Is, this is an interesting thing to me is, I mean, what did he feel about, you know, the, I mean, like basically, you know, profiting from violence. Yeah. Uh, but also, you know, supposedly being a pacifist. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? It's like, a good question. He was, um, you know, as a younger man, he had the anti-capitalist pacifist sentiments, but part of the uh, ethos of the Thelemic Church or the OTO is and this is in all of Crowley's literature, is do what thou wilt. Yeah. So he was actually very libertarian. And so when when World War II was happening, you know, it's real easy to pick a side, mm-hmm. you know, and he was, he was anti-fascist. He yeah. was very much, I, it's better, he wrote extensively on this stuff. He wrote his own poetry, started yeah. doing art, and he published some of his own essays on the matter. Um, I don't have any of the citations here, but he he did kind of... Well, the bohemian nature would, would lead you to believe that. He's yeah. not going to be on board with, you right. know, goose-stepping. Right. He he definitely was not. He, he had... He made some, you know, remarks about, you know, this will be the thing that, that puts the fascists on their ass and stuff like that. So yeah. I think the... His moral stance of that was that he was doing something for the greater good. Yeah. Did he have any kind of comments on on communism, the Red Scare, that whole time? Was he, did he have any kind of feeling or or notions about that? Because that's kind of like the opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah. I mean, the fascism kind of came back around, right? That's, right. That's the quote: "Is that Nazis lost the war, but fascism?" But at won first, it? it'd be very common for an American bohemian to think that communism is good. So I yeah, like... yeah. He he was courted by communist groups during his time in college, but he. 
you know, I think he was, it was still so, a bit rigid for him. Yeah, any yeah. sort of orthodoxy was just not his bag, baby. Yeah, you know, so um, he just. He, I think that communism communism wouldn't jibe with his kind of do with that wilt. Yeah, um, philosophy. Um, but yeah, he he was courted many times, and he he did. You know, he would talk to when he was talking to the FBI and stuff. He really did convince him that he was just not into that, and I think he wasn't. He yeah. was kind of he did a lot for proto libertarianism, right? I mean, he was fucking his mom and dogs with doing drugs and shooting off rockets <laughs> in the riverbed, dude. Yeah, it's a different kind of American dream, isn't it? <laughs> you gotta, I mean, you gotta look at pictures of this guy too. Such a playboy, such a Tony Stark. Yes. Um, the pictures of them in the riverbed, just chilling out. They look stoned as there's like rockets going off in the background. Yeah. Um, this, I love this guy. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is. This is a work hard, play harder dude. Sure. And his leg. I mean, no, they don't teach you about him in school. For, you know, I could see why, but this guy's advances have informed the 20th and 21st century more than, uh, I mean, you know, on par with Einstein. Right. Yeah. I think that well, another aspect of that, that whole thing that's very intriguing to me as far as the Howard Hughes thing is, you know, it, there is there is a lot of that time that's very hard to know because you are, you know, at war and you are trying to do things under the cloak of secrecy, like... Uh, Howard Hughes had a thing where he was paid to look like he was undertaking a massive project so that they could build the atomic bomb somewhere else. Yeah. So like he was just doing a whole staged fraud thing. Yeah. Disinfo. Yeah. Uh, so it's like it's yeah it's it's uh there's a lot of there's a lot of secrecy there and then when you get into the the contract aspect of war even back then you know so yeah. much before Iraq and and stuff yeah. like that where contractors got out of hand. There is still that aspect where it's a way that the government can play a little dirtier because you're in the business world. Exactly. It's it's uh you know it's a um, pushing off of responsibility. It's like hey, we're just paying these people to do it. Whatever they do on their own time is yeah is their own thing. Yeah, and that's a that's a, a reason why I am surprised he caught so much government flack because it would seem like they would try to keep those guys close. But I then th again, also I think maybe you're just you could never trust a guy that freewheeling. Yeah, you. I think they were keeping tabs on everybody. Yeah, you know, especially the people that worked for them. I think just like any company does. If you work for a corporation, sure, they're, you know, your yeah. instant messages are all logged. Yeah, they're they do all a over, drug yeah. test before you even work there. Yeah, excuse me, and they have you know code of conduct and everything like that. So it's no surprise that the buttoned up U.S. government was going to do that too. Mm -hmm. And but despite all that, they still kept giving him money up until you know, yeah. just a few years before he was that good. He was that good. Yeah. I, I, I just, I wonder where all of that occult shit came from. In like the larger scale or just for him? Just for him. Yeah, the four, I mean, at 14 trying to summon the devil. I mean, this is before, you know, Judas Priest and Slayer. And, you know, there's, sure, there's, no, there's yeah. no metal. <laughs> which which led to a lot of interest in the occult later. Yeah, yeah you're right, you're right. Uh, I think it, it was probably just... <laughs> His, you know, trips to the library, reading science fiction. I mean, it, science fiction is a hop, skip, and a jump away from um, the occult, right? It, right. It, back then, science fiction basically was the occult. It was looked at as the same, yeah. yeah. And I think that's probably where he, he first whet his appetite for that. Yeah. Um, dude, this was a real treat for me to look into. Yeah, man, that shit is fucking out of hand. Yeah. Uh, I am gonna. I, I have a couple books that I still haven't finished on him that I'm really excited to read and get mm. more info on because I know I missed some weird kinky shit, mm -hmm. and that's right up my alley, <laughs> listeners. And uh, there's a couple of movies my too sinners. that have been made. <laughs> my sinners. <laughs> uh, there are a couple of movies that have been made, kind of little documentaries. One was called Jet Propelled Antichrist. Mm -hmm. He did at one point declare himself the Antichrist or an Antichrist. Yeah. Um. But not in a, not in like a total like satanic way. It's, it's it's weird what the term meant for them in that church, um, and apparently, and the last I read is that Ridley Scott's company, mm -hmm. I think it's called Scott Free, had optioned the rights to making a miniseries or a movie about Jack's life. Really? I mean, I can't believe it hasn't done been done yet. Yes, yes. It, it is. It reads like it's if you. This is real life, and yeah. it sounds crazy. Yeah, it's, it's like Forrest Gump, but with more sex and drugs. Yeah, and how about Elrond getting one over on him, huh? Isn't that crazy? 
Like immediately, immediately. I love this. Guy. Well, there's that crazy thing of like you know, uh, you know, Tex from the Manson mm-hmm. family was the charismatic guy. Yeah. Until Charles Manson showed up. Yep. And then he was duped. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. like Parsons kind of like Tex. Yeah. And Elrond's kind of like Manson. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's like suddenly this guy shows up, takes your wife and your money, it does everything better than you did. Yeah. And and th- I mean if you want he talks about, you know, being in touch with a higher intelligence which he then claimed to be. Yeah. Elrond did. And being like preternaturally gifted in the magical arts and if y- whatever you want to call magic or charisma or whatever, Elrond eventually had his own navy. Yeah. That is some gangster shit. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty fucking some, insane. Some, he was touched by something. And uh How about this guy though jerking off and getting the boat to turn around? Dude, I mean, come on. I don't know how many boats I've made turn around in my life, dude. <laughs> like, I mean, that's out of hand. It's nuts. It's, yeah. And if you're him and these things happen, you got to believe it to be true. And you don't it's, do it for yeah. years without some pay, like some return on investment, man. That's right. a lot of seed spilled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tablets, not. I mean, them coming, yeah, them coming back is just. Isn't that you, wild? You're definitely like, this shit is real. Yeah. And so, of course, you're going to continue. With the prostituting and the drugs and the rockets until you blow up at 37. 37. 37. And also, again, to, uh, uh, you know, a uh, possible murder angle. It's it's also a time where he's on an upswing. Just as things are about to get good again, you know? He, yeah, he he's that... back to the parties. Mm-hmm. I, all those, you know, spending his last times on hookers for sex magic got yeah. him the job, which got him the drugs again. And, right. And, and maybe a way out to Israel. Yeah. But not so fast, my friend. Yeah. It blows up. Blows up. Yeah. And it seems a lot later uh, than he should have blown up himself. Oh, yeah. How many times could he have blown up? Like, I'm not saying, I know every time you're fucking around with that shit, you're rolling the dice. Yeah. But by that point, if you're ever going to have a handle on it, it would be then. Which again leads me to believe that it was, murder. and that and that's what that's what a lot of his co his colleagues said was that he, he, despite his kind of reckless behavior, he was very very safe all the time. Yeah, in his experimentation. Yeah, um, and so that's why there's there's some doubt as to how it happened. Um, but also, you're working, you're literally working with mercury, man. Who knows? Yeah. One, one accident, um, sure. a distraction, it, it can happen. But yeah. Uh, and then, you know, your mom killing her. It's just so every I mean, even after right. even after he blows up, yeah. There's more shit that that comes out. It's And was there anybody that was like a like a like a kind of like a Parsons fanatic that I would know of? Like kind of like a, a wow. school of like, you know, the legacy of Parsons. Was anybody kind of Um you know, there um do you know who Robert Anton Wilson is? No. Robert Anton Wilson is another kind of like polymath lecturer guy uh-huh. into the occult. He's written books like um, Sex, Drugs, and Magic with ah, a K. Yeah. Uh, and you can listen to Robert Anton Wilson's lectures online. He has this kind of New York accent, uh, but he's brilliant and can just ramble on from topic to topic. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> the New York accent talking about oh, science and jerking off. Yeah, and quantum. Shit. You know, and then conspiracy theory and stuff. Right. He really he wrote the foreword to uh, one book I read called um, Sex and Rockets. The the life of of Jack Parsons, and he wrote the foreword or the introduction to that. Huh. Um. And he, he you know he knows all about Crowley and yeah and uh, and Elron. Yeah, and, I mean, what a fucking cast of characters. Yeah. Um. It, for the listeners, if I mean, Alistair Crowley is uh somebody that makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, reading about, and I have a pretty healthy appetite for weird, yeah, disturbing stuff. But uh, Alistair is is. He's the worst. He's kind of... But the best. He's kind of legitimizing, yeah, being a sociopath. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I, may, I may look more into Alistair. I've got a couple of his little of his writings that I'm too scared to finish reading. Yeah, it's, 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 it's scary. Because, like, you know, there's, like, Anton LaVey in the Church of Satan and stuff, and that stuff is more, like, cute. Yeah, it's more Whereas of a, Crowley is he seriously was, he believed it. believing in evil. Yeah, he... He's worthy of his own profile. He is. But, um, I mean, just, just to give you some background as a listener, like, you know, he would go trip on hashish in the pyramids and felt like he was talking to Egyptian deities, and then he would do weird, weird sex magic stuff with human uh, f- fluids and 
solids. Jesus. Blood. Yeah, yeah, he was super, super weird. And, uh, <laughs> eccentric. Very, very. I like the, the inclusion of solids. Why don't we get some shit in this spell? <laughs> hey! Mm, Ooh. Yummy! Ooh, is this magic? <laughs> Have you tried shitting on it? Uh. <laughs> Eat it! <laughs> John, how was this profile? This was great. I like loved it. This. I was really excited to tell you this one. I, 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 I every I, time I, I would come across something, I'd be like, "Oh, John's gonna love this." Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I think it's still pretty mysterious. Uh, just like his motivations and uh, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, yeah. and for such a high profile person, surrounded by other high profile people, uh, you know. It's just like I, it's, it's it, and and you know, a, a documentable life as much as you can have at the time. Mm-hmm. It's still just like, fuck, who the fuck is this guy? You yeah, know what to I mean? take something. I mean, it's it's as if there was someone now who was obsessed with the idea, like I said earlier, of like teleporting. Yeah, a person. Yeah, to the moon. Yeah, and they just figured it out, or at least began to. Yeah, and. uh it's almost in a weird way like Jeff Goldblum in the fly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna do some weird stuff. Yeah. But one of these days we're gonna do it. And if you're beholding it as a as a bystander at the time, the the success of the science and the magic hand in hand by one person is terrifying. Yeah. Especially when they're palling around with fucking Egypts yeah. like Elrond and yeah. fucking Crowley. Yeah, it, I mean it makes you think that maybe there's something to it. Yeah, and it also makes me think... It got us to the moon. I mean, you wonder if there is some kind of inkling that this guy had, even if it's like a mental illness or something, from the beginning that was just telling him, like, there is something to this dark art shit. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and it, remember, the, the, a lot of the time this was happening, this was, you know, there was just radio and yeah. books. Yeah, yeah. N- no antibiotics. So this dude was getting nasty. <laughs> Penicillin wasn't invented till like 1930 or something. 19- oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and this guy was thinking about other planets. Yeah. And it just take you know uh, it just takes that type of um, eccentricity and madness to really propel um, the human race forward. You know, these most great men are not good people. Is something I say a lot. Yeah. You don't. You don't get. You don't get to the moon with measured um, <clears throat> expectations. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people thinking you're a lunatic when you're, you know, Christopher Columbus and mm-hmm. shit like that. And you know, there's a lot of people saying, you know, you're suicidal mm-hmm. and stuff like that. He's mad. And, yeah, you know, you can't do it. Um, but there also is uh, there also is a lot of darkness there. There's a lot of darkness there. Yeah. Uh, and and he has a crater on the dark side of the moon named after him. That is so. Who did that? Like the moon body governing agency. I don't know. Oh, the moon. Wh- wh- the wh- moon men. Whoever does that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. The people who do those. That kind of yeah. 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 Yeah, it's interesting to think about you know the legit scientists afterward that just poured over his stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are he, he. He's not really talked about a lot, uh, purposely. Well, yeah, I mean, I think he probably carries a bad rep. Right, but the people at, you know, the people who know at Caltech know. Right. And they still revere him in, in, in a way. Uh-huh. But he was a total maverick. Yeah. His name was Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote poetry. I f- oh, gosh, I forget what the line was, but uh, he, he praises peyote and yeah. Don Quixote, he rhymes those two things together. Oh, uh, wow, this guy was and great. And cocaine. <laughs> I mean, he, he was chopped up, dude. He was chopped up. He was chopped up, uh, banging a lot, just slinging dick, shooting rockets, <laughs> blowing shit up, dude. That's the kind of guy he was, and that's the kind of guy that we need more of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you think you think more more blowing up and more... more Chopping up. More chopping up. I More do. loose dick. Yeah, we could use it. Listen, in this politically correct <laughs> climate, right? We need some explosions and some coke. Mix and some it up loose a little dick. bit. Mix some glue up with some gunpowder. See what happens. Yeah. Yeah, God, what a fucking lunatic. Yeah, I'm gonna continue. I'm gonna look more. And there was it. never a kid. There's no kids. 
No, he paid for that lady all to have an abortion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. So, he died. I mean, all that life in 37 years, like. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I, I hope you enjoyed it, John. I had, I had a blast. Uh, I really, really, really did. And I do want to find out so much more. Yeah. And I do know you're kind of planning on possibly having some of the side characters be profiles themselves. Mm-hmm. Not even ones we've really talked about. Right. Uh, so that's very exciting. Um could try to do that some more uh, in the program is have some th- some tie-ins for people that are following. Yeah. And uh, try to give you a little extra payoff by profiling somebody connected. Yeah. Um, this was a great episode. I'm I, glad uh, you, you feel that you way. You entertained the living shit out of me. Oh, I love doing that. You know that, right? Yes, I do. Um, I, are we about cooked? I think we're about cooked. Uh, re- again, for you listening, if you like high quality Swedish manufacturing and engineering, yes, Studio headphones are the headphones for you. The Volvo of headphones. It's studiosweden.com, and the uh, the code is Profiles15 for fifteen percent off any of their fine Swedish products. That's a deal. I, I don't. I don't care who you are in this economy. Uh huh. I can take 15%. Yeah, probably some nice tempur foam in the oh, headphones. Forget oh about it. Oh, Lord. Yeah. If you got a weird head or whatever, you yeah. know. Hey, it'll fit. It'll fit. They'll, it fits to you. You can get a Clang. Oh, the Clang the model. The Clang model oh. is very nice. Please it, it, please do, if, you, if you're on the market for some, some headphones, uh, buy them, use the code. We'll, we'll get a little bit of that coin, and we'll use it to keep this freak show running. Yes, and please subscribe to the Unpopular Opinion Network. Uh, that is a way of supporting us yes. financially. Uh, rate and review the, please, the show please, on iTunes. Review. Please, please. Thank you guys so much. Uh, for episode five, this, well, we're now weekly at this point. That is correct. And uh, we couldn't be happier. Oh, uh, uh, it's been a blast. As always, thank you to Matt Brousseau for making us sound wonderful. And Aaron, thank you for being the best co-host. Oh, thank you for being the best well, main ho- host. I, whatever. Daddy? Whatever. The, the daddy. The daddy the, of yeah, the show? Yeah, the daddy of the Ooh, show. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this was fun. Thank you for letting me do this, John. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, and yeah. listeners, I hope you enjoyed it. Yes, uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, we love you. Thank you for listening. I'm John Fahey. I'm Aaron Pita. Good night, guys. Bye.